Yo. Yo. What's awesome. up? What's going? What's what? How's it going? And what's <laughs> up? What's going? It's going. It's going. I'm wearing a ridiculous yellow hat. Okay. Oh, yellow hat. <clears throat> you know, it's very comfortable walking around one's house with a ridiculous hat on, but then you see yourself. <laughs> on <the screen. laughs> yeah. No. 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 That's what uh? It should be. What basketball player we got there? Is that? This uh, this actually is an imaginary basketball player. This was a gift from uh, when we were in Oklahoma City. It's an OKC jersey. I was gonna say it looks like Westbrook, but it, yeah, it, I was like, it doesn't quite look like Westbrook. What? It says Featherbone, who's an imaginary character that we made up on the tour bus, my first tour. Well, yeah, <laughs> he's a detective and he solves crimes. <laughs> So, I mean, that all makes sense. Did the organization give that to you or? Um... Um, I think, I, I don't know if it was the city or the organization or something, but I think so. How did they get in on the inside joke? How did they? I think our tour manager told them about Featherbone. And so <laughs> they, we all got funny jerseys and mine says Featherbone. Hi, Rachel. We're just talking about the... Yeah, you're talking about Featherbone, the origins. Yes, yeah. exactly. The Ridiculous. man, the myth, the legend. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a big basketball fan? Uh, sort of. More of a Knicks fan, which means I'm more of a, like a masochist. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like the way this jersey looks, so I put it up on the wall. Uh, Bucks played the Knicks the other night, and yeah. uh, um, y'all beat us. I saw it was, that. Yeah. It was a fun game where we like decided not to start any of our like normal starters. So it was yeah. like a real oddball. That's also, the only way we're gonna win. So well, I don't know. Y'all doing good this year. Julius Randle <laughs> just decided to um, be an MVP. So well, he was we'll just like, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, hi, Rachel. I'm Justin. Hi, Justin. Um, could you both just introduce yourselves quick? Yes. This is Rachel. I sing in Lake Street Dive. And this is Aki. I play piano and sing in Lake Street Dive. That's Stella. Oh, and this is Stella. She's going to say hi. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Hi, Stella. Um, this, is Stella on the tour? Is Stella on the tour? Oh. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> no, Stella. Stella's a homebody. Sadly not. We can't take her anywhere. Um, well, I had a... Uh, I was, I talked to my friend, Jen Daunt, who I talk to frequently. And she said, uh, I remember when, when hypotheticals came out, she sent me the track and she was like, Oh, we got a new song from Lake, Lake street dive. And, um, I was like, okay. Um, first of all, are, are both of you recording on your ends? Uh, yes. I will start right now. Got it. It's going to okay. be a lot of me talking to myself at the beginning of this. But yes, it's recorded. Oh, that, that would be great. <laughs> um, well, Jen sent me uh, the song and uh, was like, oh, this is a new song from Lake Street Drive. And I was like, this is different. <laughs> I was like, uh, I, I, I was like, this, this sounds like a different band. What, like, what, <laughs> what, is, what is going on? And she was like, oh, they have a new uh, member of the band. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's, it's very, I was like, it's, it's, it's very present. And, uh, um, and Aki, that is you. Yes. Um, how did you have such a, such an influence on this album and sound and how did that happen? Oh, it's, it was all uh, organic and gradual. I started touring with the band in, uh, early 2017 and uh, we slowly, I think, just incorporated keys into the sound a little bit more uh, intrinsically. And then I worked on the, the 2018 record, Free Yourself Up. So I wasn't writing or anything like that, but I was playing a lot of keys and doing some BGVs on that. And, and then for the, yeah. And Rachel, how did you, how did you find Aki to start touring with and, and know yeah. that you wanted you're yeah like, we need this we need this guy yeah. on tour <laughs> yeah well we met because we played a show together mm -hmm. and um we became instant fans of aki's music and so would go to his shows and Aki, hope what band that are you he... in at this time 
it was just my solo. It's just me. It's it's a it's hard. It's hard to describe. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It's like yeah. But to me, it was one of one of the reasons why living in New York was so great. It was just going being able to go see Aki play like eleven o'clock sets at night on Mondays at Could one you of our. Describe it. Uh, yeah, I can describe it. It's like, it's, it's like the best singing you've ever heard, like on the level of like Donny Hathaway and like Stevie Wonder, but he, but very like self-effacing, doesn't want anyone to watch him play. So plays the latest sets as possible <laughs> and then makes a lot of jokes and disparages himself in between, um, songs mm -hmm. and then like plays like gut wrenching, uh, covers of like a Joni Mitchell song or, uh, a Van Morrison song, and then he's been he, and then it's songs about um, there's an alien love story that he's that you've been writing for a long time, yes. and so he would he would um, play more songs from the alien love story musical that he's writing. So we would get like more installments to be like, oh, it's a new one. Uh, so it was just a treat, and like he's just like a huge nerd as well. Made that very apparent on stage. Yes. So I mean, I you know it was really like going to see him over the years. We definitely knew what we were getting ourselves into with Aki, which is why we were like, we want this guy to come on tour with us. It was Aki that had no idea. Yes. We gave him very little information and no mm -hmm. rehearsal time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I feel like we just kind of brushed right past an alien <laughs> love story that I would <laughs> like to just go back just a tiny bit. And uh, so that's revisit. how I normally like to address it by brushing past it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, could, could, you, could you just uh, give us a bit of an overview of the alien love story? Yes, I can. It's uh, an alien that crash lands on Earth. It falls in love with a human and they sing songs back and forth. It's like West Side Story meets Star Trek, sort of. Uh, that's, that's all you really need to know. And then you just start listening to whatever happens. Wow. What a saga. Mm -hmm. It has become a saga. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is there like a, is there a corresponding book or is there a, a an, one day, maybe it's one uh, day. all the papers you see behind me are essentially alien love songs material. So <laughs> or is this a one man things. show or a play? It could be all those things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's everything. It's all everything. of the above. It's space. It's time. Yes, <laughs> it is. Uh, and so, so Aki is, is touring and he is sounding great. Like, I, I think like Lake Street Dive, I think of all of you as just like fantastic musicians. I think Thank like you. when I am thinking of you as first, it's like for Aki to be in, I think the bar must be very high because you are I'm like the, it must be the only the best musicians uh, possible. Yeah, I yeah, I can be honest that we weren't thinking in, in the terms of like, we are the best musicians, so we therefore must find <laughs> the best musicians. I think that uh, uh, it was, yeah, we, I think we felt uh, intrinsically like there would be a really great crossover of like the types of music that we both appreciate, all mm. of us appreciate. And, um, and that also like Aki would bring something new uh, musically, even with just what he listens to, the things that he could show us. So, and we, and I think we felt that there was a crossover in like sort of the jazz world. So that's nice because it's sort of the first language we all learned to speak musically. You know, we met in jazz school. Um, yeah, but I th think, you know, also being, you know, a multi-instrumentalist, you know, playing keys and being such a great singer was, you know, a huge bonus for us because background vocals are a big part of our sound. Um, I... I had heard that there was a very formal uh, inviting to the band. Yes. <laughs> We're cutting out. <laughs> is this is Bridget spreading? The... <laughs> yeah, it was. The story? It, yeah, I mean, I could. We can tell from different perspectives. Actually, the perspective that I had was that I didn't know that we were going to like formally present you with rings mm -hmm. um so that's that's where the, the the personality of Bridget Carney comes in like we we had said like let's take Aki out to dinner and just and let him know how we feel like as, as long as you want to play with us we want you with us mm -hmm. um and then when we showed up at the restaurant 
Bridget was like, well, I got these rings. So I thought we could present them with these, with each with a ring and say, will you band marry us? And I was like, okay, I think he's going to be very embarrassed. (laughs) (laughs) Aki, were you in fact very embarrassed or what's going through your mind as rings Uh, are being uh, presented to you? I I had no idea. plastic rings thrust upon my salad plate. <laughs> so uh, I just said, yes, yes, a thousand times yes. <laughs> um, and then, so you're in the band and uh, I, I feel like your contribution to obviously is, is very present. Um, how do you start interacting with the band and how do you form the sound on this album? I, I think I can tell you from my perspective, yeah. the same way that they've, been building their sound previous to that i just sort of was folded into the process the the songwriting process was like super collaborative so it was like bring some ideas bring a song uh share it with somebody else in the band ask them to help you you know craft it into a a finished piece bring that to the whole band and the whole band sort of crafts that into a, a lake street dive song and so I just I just started throwing you know my my tunes into the into the hat and people were throwing tunes at me and and the rest is history. What was like what was a what was like a moment on the album that you were really happy with getting in or a moment where you were like this you know you had a big uh, contribution that you were uh, proud of. Uh, let's see. Well, one definitely for sure is Lackluster Lover, which is a, a, a sketch that Rachel sent me uh, when we were on tour. And she said, can you do anything with this? And it was like a guitar and voice demo. And I immediately heard this groove under it. And so I sent it back to her with me <laughs> singing uh, all the stuff. And uh, and then she was like, great, let's just send this to the band. And I was like, wait, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> too late. <laughs> Well, that's yeah, that's how I felt. I, it's done. I was like, the song is done. Black Luster Lover is a diss track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a great diss track. It is a diss track. I was, I was like, Damn. yeah. 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 I mean, sometimes you find demos that you wrote when you were 25 and, mm. you know, you were in a diss phase. Uh huh. So that's, <laughs> there's a, an uncovering. Yeah. That, I mean, the idea for that, yeah came came from an old an old an old experience <laughs> but uh yeah you know i think we're not uh, much of an experience <laughs> exactly um also in hearing um nobody stopping you now um i had heard that that was a, a like a letter to your to your teenage self yeah um, who yeah who, were, who was your teenage self how would you My- describe that person well, I was thinking about a specific phase of, of Rachel, um, which was the summers between the, the eight, when I was like 12, 13, 14 years old. And I was a pretty, uh, you know, weird child as I think most people are around that age. Cause I think like around 14 and 15, you start, sort of start to realize that people view you in a certain way. And then you automatically sort of subconsciously change. Cause you're like, oh no, that, that couldn't be right. So, um, I missed those sort of weird summers where I was just like a very strange child. You know, I, I, I remember I was very dirty all the time. No one paid attention to me because I'm the youngest of four. So I just sort of like ran around the neighborhood and I found little pockets where that I like assumed were magical. And I had like, a, I had a very wild imagination and full stories and uh, in my head and, um, I was kind of talking to that person because I was like, you know, I want you to stay, stay right there, stay, stay right where you are. Um, and that shift that, that starts to happen and, and especially like for just from August to September, you know, you just, you're in a, your own summer reality um, mm. inside your head and your imagination. And then you have to go back to school and it's sort of this crushing thing where you realize you have to fit in in certain ways. So it was kind of to, about all of those things. That is beautiful. Um, with a, having a band who can do anything and like your, you know, you said that your first language is jazz and your, um, how do you decide when you're so proficient in kind of everything, 
um, like what route to go or what, you know, what sound to have, cause you're not bound by your skill set. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I think, uh, limitations are helpful. So on the opposite side of that, sometimes I think it can be a little bit maddening and yeah. we can, we can cast a wide net. And so when we're deciding on the vibe of a song, it can just go so many directions. And sometimes uh, that it can be hard <laughs> basically mm -hmm. to decide because, you know, someone will present a song and they're like, weird, I kind of heard it like a Otis Redding, like 60s soul tune. And someone was like, strange. I thought it was kind of like a rockabilly Elton John song. <laughs> and you're like, what? And then everyone's like, what kind of song is it? And then you're like, maybe it should be an acapella ballad. And, and, uh, and you know, being a band that has, um, you know, sort of no interest in sticking to a certain genre. Um, sometimes it can be hard to sort of zero in on the heart of a song. And for this record, it was really helpful um, to have Mike Elizondo there because um, he, he definitely, uh, he picked the songs that he, I think, got an immediate like vibe to. He was just like, that's, this is how I hear this song. And that's why I think uh, y'all should put it on the record because we gave him like 30 songs. So it was, it was helpful to have somebody that experienced and someone we trusted that much to help us zero in on the vibe of a song. Like hypotheticals could have gone a lot of ways, but I think I really feel like it reached its pinnacle. Mm. Yeah. Um, it must be to have an outside voice there to, I mean, I could just hear that that could just be limitless to, to you know and to to have somebody there um must be great um uh, i wanted to ask a question of each of you so we've been talking about your music but i would love to know and i'd love to come out of this with a a song from somebody else and i would love to know what you have been listening to um so aki what is like a song that you have been listening to recently that you really love Oh no! Um, I, I, I've been listening to so much weird stuff. Hit me with uh, the weirdness. I, well, I'm here it's, for weird. It's too weird. Nobody it's wants not to too hear weird. about it. Oh my god! Yes, I do. The weird. Okay. The better. Well, um, <laughs> this is absurd that I'm telling you this. Yes. There is a compendium of 20th century composer uh, Ligeti. <laughs> Uh, called the Ligeti Project, <laughs> and I've been very much. Into... I shouldn't be laughing because this is amazing music. It's so I'm, ridiculous. I'm not, it's uh, not. It's amazing. That's what I'm checking out. He has a great, a violin concerto. Oh no, it's a cello concerto, but it has microtonal ocarinas in it, which Ooh. is just stunning. Uh, yeah. Super what weird is, and strange. What is it called? It's called. It's called the cello concerto. It has no name. It's just. Uh, it's got like a opus number or something like that. And what what is this guy's name? Ligeti, L-I-G-E-T-I. -E Tell me more about him. It's deep. <sighs> uh, tw 20th so century composer, sort of like post, post romantic, maybe sort of uh, in the 12 tone atonal area, but a little bit more uh, interested in like so some sort of like post tonality, if that makes sense. So it's not completely out, but it is very, very strange. Was he one of the first composers to use electronics? I I think so. I thinking... You think he's Stockhausen? Yeah. Yeah, but it's all the Ligeti project is great. It's like nine hours of insane music that will make you doubt whether or not your ears work. So. <laughs> what draws you to this? I don't know. It's it's like a, it's a great um, like a sorbet course between checking out records. So I listen to a lot of people's records and stuff because things come out. And yeah. then sometimes I need something that's completely removed from that. And so listening to something like that is just such a sea change that yeah. then you're like, okay, let me check out this new Pino Palladino Blake Mills record. Mm, I love <laughs> uh, that record. That record actually sounds amazing. That's also what I've been listening to, but I don't know the names of anything yet. So that's, that's a beautiful it's, record. I think it's just called Blake Mills and Pino Palladino. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's so know. good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. That's one of the most interesting answers I have ever gotten. And uh, I love it. I, think, I hope someone's around to wake your listeners up. <laughs> Rachel, what about you? What have you been listening to? I've just been listening to, to that Anderson Pac and Bruno Mars song yes. on repeat. 
Oh I my just, god! I just took I just took a drive and I listened to it like seven times in a row. <laughs> okay, I have been trying to convince my boss that this is a great song, and he for some reason is like fighting me on it. What? Um, what? Don't fight it. Yeah, it's a perfect. I, I, it's a perfect song. Tell me why. Tell me why so that I can tell him why. Because he it's, loves both artists, but some reason is. It's like, one of the best songs of that type of song that I've ever heard. Like it's just as good as any of the rest of them like as any like Smokey Robinson song like it's just it, it hits all the marks and what I can't believe is that they managed to write a song that has like multiple hooks you're like where's is this the chorus right. um oh no this is the chorus but also that they managed to um compose something that so perfectly suited each of their very different voices mm -hmm. so you just have these like very distinct parts and like everybody's shining and I mean and it's funny. See, the thing is, I'm, I think funniness is underrated in songs. And there's so many points in, in the lyrics where you just have to laugh. You know, when you're hungry, girl, I got fillets. <laughs> <laughs> you know they were laughing in the studio. I yeah. love that. I love when there's humor in music. I love that. I love both of these. And... Uh, um... I think I had to keep this conversation to 20 minutes and we're right at 20. So uh, this is great. Yeah, um, this was fun. This is great. Aki, Rachel, thank you for, for talking. Thank you for obviously and hypotheticals. And thank you for some atonal music recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>